Good evening. Good to see everybody out tonight. Uh, I know that it's Friday night and the world's got a lot out there for to entice people away, but uh, glad for everyone that made their way out. And I think the Lord will bless us for our coming. And we're looking forward to this weekend. Uh, started out, I said we'd make it a weekend meeting, and it got put down weekend revival. And I said, that's all right. We'll, we'll make it a revival. <laughs> we can have a revival. And uh, we're just looking forward to it. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Our loving Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come into your house again, Lord, to hear the word, Father, and to worship you, Father. We pray that you just be with us in a special way, Lord. You know each need. And Lord, we pray that you just look in each heart, and Lord, and help us, Lord, to go away with something, Father, that you have for us. We know that you prepared a table for us, Lord, and we pray that you would just bless us and just be with this service in a special way. Speak to hearts, we pray, and just bless, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad to see each one of you here tonight, the first night of this weekend revival. God has blessed us with excellent weather. We appreciate that. And with traveling mercies for our evangelist, Brother David Frazier, we're proud to have him and his wife, Carol, and their daughter, Rena, with us tonight. Would you stand? And we will sing page number 277 for our meet and greet song. So if you haven't shaken his hand already, then come right up here and let this family know that they are welcome, and as well as our other visitors tonight. Page 277, as we sing verse 2, step out and let's welcome one another. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free as free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full
Jesus holds all power in his mighty hands divine. Is he a friend of yours? He's a friend of mine. Thank the Lord. It's time to go to God in prayer. And there is a good report for the request that I brought to you Wednesday evening, the urgent request concerning the future of an individual. God is moving. Um, that's all I can say. It's not completed work done yet, but God is working and moving, and I thank him for that. But keep this individual in your prayers. Do you have requests that you would like to bring forth tonight? Yes, Marilyn. Okay, so pray for Robin and the family as they travel. A lot of kids going off to college. Brother David and Sister Carol's oldest daughter left yesterday, Wednesday, <clears throat> her first year in college. So keep these kids in your prayers and also the kids going back to school. Is there another? Yes. Very true. <clears throat> okay, pray for this special need for Ken, <clears throat> Ken Thompson, that God would move upon him, not only physically, but spiritually. Speak to his heart at this time. Others? Jerry L. Rod in Berrien Center. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. All right, Sister Vice, Sister Stella, pray that God would move upon her. Unspoken requests you have signified by the upraised hand. God knows every one of them. Would you stand, please? <clears throat> Our altars are open for any who would like to come forward and kneel. In prayer there, you can stay where you are if you would prefer that. But for our prayer course tonight, Lord, lay some soul up on my heart and love that soul through me. And may I humbly do my part to win that soul for thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we consider an honor and a privilege, O oh God, to be in your house this night, Father, to lift praise and honor unto thee, O oh God. Father, dear God, here we are, your people, O oh God, depending on you, Father. Lord God, you know the many needs, O oh Lord. Father, O oh God, you've heard the prayer requests. We pray, O oh God, for those, O oh God, that are taking their loved ones to college, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, we ask that you would be with our young people. We ask, O oh God, also that you would be with the kids, Father, as uh, they return back to school in September, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, for traveling mercy for those, Father, that will be traveling back home, O oh God. You know each one, dear Lord, we pray. Lord God, we pray, we ask, Father, that you would move upon our nation. We ask, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Father. We ask, Father, too, that you would just be, Father, 
with our unsaved loved ones and, and family, oh God. Our friends, Lord, Father, oh God. And Lord Jesus, you know the ones that have received the invitations, Father, for this weekend meeting. We pray, oh God, that somehow your Holy Spirit will move, Father, upon their hearts. Father, oh God, if it's just out of curiosity to come and see, Father, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would move, Father, upon these ones, oh God. Father, dear God, you know just where they are. And Father, dear God, we think of this one that Sister Kathy mentioned, Father, this one that need a special prayer, Father, and your hand is working, Father. We have no doubt, oh God, that you would work, oh God. So, Father, dear God, we just ask for a complete work there, Father. And, Lord God, we wouldn't forget to give thee all of the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus, Father. And, Lord God, we pray for this uh, family member, this son of Sister Joanne's. Lord God, you know where he stand with thee, O oh God. Father, dear God, we pray, Father, that you would just move upon his heart. We pray, O oh God, that in a soft voice, Father, you would speak to him. Come unto me. O oh God, how we depend on you so much, O oh Lord. And Father, we, we think of Sister uh, Vi's Sister Stella. You know the need there, O oh God. So, Father, oh God, we just pray in the name of Jesus. We ask, oh God, believing, Lord Jesus, that you would move upon this situation, oh God. And, Father, the many unspoken requests, oh God, that we have upon our hearts, Father, you know each and every one of them, oh God. Father, oh God, we thank you that we can bring these needs before you. We thank you that we can leave them with you, oh God, and trust and believe. Lord God, that you will handle the situation, oh God. Lord God, now here we are in this service. We pray, oh God, that everything that is done and said, that it would be to the glory of Jesus Christ, Father. Speak to our hearts, oh God. We pray, Father, that you would be with this brother. We ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will just rest upon him in an unusual way, oh God. Help him, oh God, to deliver himself, Father, with what you have for us, oh God. Lord God, we were so excited to come to the house of the Lord on a Friday night, oh God. Father, oh God, our hearts yearn for more of thee. And Father, we can have it. We can have it, Lord. You don't bar yourself from us. Father, all we have to do is come to thee. Oh God, how we thank and praise you. And now, Father, oh God, as we turn this service over to you, we ask that thou would meet every need, and we thank you for it, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your hymnals to page 326. Page 326. The future lies unseen ahead, it holds my know not what, but still I know I need not dread. Christ, we've gone before. I'll follow him 
following with rejoicing the world knows the difference and you can't fool them ushers would you come forward and receive the offering what you give tonight and tomorrow night will go directly to the evangelist through the church uh, Sunday morning you will have the opportunity to give your offerings and your tithes to the church but for tonight and tomorrow night and Sunday night these offerings will go to the evangelist brother Olin would you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you again. Lord, thanking you again for the portion of service went full. Father, we just ask you to continue to bless, Lord. Bless, Lord, in your word, Lord, as we set and exert, Lord, and just take it all in, Father. We just praise you for it. Thank you for it and praise you, Father. Now, Lord, as we attempt to take this offer, Lord, you see each one, Lord, as we stand here, Lord, and each one sit in the pews, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to bless the offer to be seen, Lord. May Father may give those who have to give and don't have to give. Father, we will give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. We praise you. Amen. And now before the message, page 375. 375, she was playing the song, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. When we love Jesus, and this song, My Jesus, I Love Thee, we desire the Holy Spirit. We desire that infilling fresh every day because of his love for us and our love for him. My Jesus, I Love Thee. Oh. Uh -huh. 
It's my privilege at this time to introduce you, Brother David Frazier from Charlottesville, Charlottesville Virginia. Uh, I haven't known him very long, but I've enjoyed the time I've had in the fellowship. Appreciate it. Just appreciate you, brother. Preach what the Lord's got and empty All right. It's good to see everyone this evening. I'm thankful that I um, could be here this evening and get to meet all you nice folks and uh, hopefully you get to know me and I get to know you a little better. Uh, it's been a real blessing so far to see so many warm, friendly faces and the warm welcome, welcome of Sister Michael and Brother Michael. They have been a, a true welcoming committee. They've done a fine job and I'm squealing. <laughs> um, but I want you, if you have your Bibles with me, to turn to John chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm 41 years old. I grew up in the Church of God. Um, I have two daughters. Rena and Tiffany. Tiffany is my oldest daughter, and she's not here this evening. She went off to the lion's den called Virginia Tech. <laughs> I, uh, it was one of the most traumatic things I've ever done, I believe, to leave my daughter at, high, at, at college all by herself. But I thank God he gave me a sense of peace and contentment about that whole process. Um, you know, I think she's well prepared. Um, she's a great student. She's a great kid. She's very well-centered and I think she'll do fine. But you all know the influences that are in the world today. You know the, the draw of the world, you know the draw of that crowd, and you know the things that she'll face in college. So if you happen to think about her, pray for her, because she needs your prayers. And um, she needs all of our prayers, including mine. Um, like I said, I grew up in the Church of God. My mom and dad adopted me. When I was uh, 11 days old, they picked me up on a Friday evening at the hospital. And they took me to church on Sunday morning. So I grew up in the Church of God from the time I was about this big. And uh, for 18 years of my life, I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Every revival, every night of revival, we were there. Camp meetings, at least twice a summer. Um, you know, all day meetings, the whole nine yards. We went to church more than anybody I knew at the time. And uh, I told many people, when I got 18, I left home, and I got away from God. And I told many a person, I went to enough church in 18 years than most of you will ever go in your lifetimes, maybe two or three lifetimes. And I told people that. I said, I'll never go back. But you know what? God's got a way of changing your mind. God's got a way of reaching you no matter where you are. No matter what circumstances you are under at this time, he's got a way of reaching his finger down and touching your heart and reminding you of what you need to make this life real. What you need to make this life fulfilling and complete. What you were put here for. You weren't put here for the wages of sin. You were put here to serve God and to glorify God with your life and all that you do. And he reached down right where I was, and he started messing with my heart. He started talking to me, son, you need to go back to church. One day I was riding out to Kansas City with my dad, um, one of my uncles who's also in the tree business. I run a tree company, by the way. Um, but one of my uncles runs a tree company in Kansas City, Kansas. He fell out of a tree and was seriously injured. And my dad didn't want to drive all the way out there by himself, so I decided to get in the car and go with him. And uh, on our way back, my dad looked over at me. He said, son, he said, when are you going to get right with God? <laughs> That's all he said. He didn't, you know, he didn't pry into my life. He didn't mess with me. He didn't play mind games. He just said, son, when are you going to get right with God? He said, you've got two girls that are growing up. They need to know God. And it stirred my heart. And that was the beginning of probably about a six-month struggle with God wrestle with God, trying to come to terms with 
you know, my life and what it was and where it was headed. And I have, um, no matter what I've done in life, everything I've put my hand to, I've always succeeded at it. Um, God has blessed me with the gift of work and a strong work ethic and willpower and anything I put my mind to I could do. And I was very successful, but everything that I was successful in, I never found any contentment. I never found any peace. I never found any joy in those things that I was able to accomplish by my own power and by my own will. There was just nothing there for me. But one day, God kept working on my heart. He kept working on my heart. Son, you need to surrender. Son, you need to surrender. Son, you need to surrender. One day I was riding down the road. And God started to work on my heart so hard. And I just very, I had this sense of, you give your life to me now, or I'm not going to bother you anymore. I'm not going to play with you anymore. Let me tell you something. When God speaks to you in that way, I don't know if He's ever spoken to someone here in this room that way, but when He speaks to you and says, now is the time, don't put it off. Don't put it off. You're holding eternity. Not just this existence, but you're holding eternity in the palm of your hand. Almighty God who created you, who gave you breath, who gave you a mind to think, is reaching down and speaking to you. He is reaching out His hand of mercy and love to you. Don't put it off. I was so moved. I was so convicted by the power of God. I pulled my truck off on the side of the road. I said, Lord, I don't know what it means. I don't know if I'm going to lose my family. I don't know if I'm going to lose my business. I don't know what you're going to require of me, Lord. But I do know this, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to live for you. From this point forward, every moment of my life, I'm going to spend dedicated to your service. And you want to know what? It wasn't long after that my wife got saved. Praise God. And she's here with me this this evening. And it wasn't long after that my young daughter got baptized. Praise God. Because you know the devil, that was one thing he used against me the whole time. That God was working on my heart. The devil said, if you start serving God, you're going to lose your family. Your wife is going to leave you. She's going to tell you you're nuts. God give him a big black eye. (laughs) not only did he save me, but he was faithful. He saved my wife. He convicted her heart. He saved my daughter. Amen. And I'm praying that the other one will soon make a witness for Christ. Amen. She's never come out and made a public witness for Christ. She's a good kid. She's got a good heart. Just the loving, as kind person you'd ever want to meet. But that doesn't get you into the kingdom of God. You can be good all your days, and it doesn't do you a bit of good as far as the kingdom of God. Until you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords, amen, you will never enter in except you be born again. Enough about me. Thank you for giving me that opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. But on the thought of getting to knowing one another, I think one of the great shortcomings in the Christian world today, and one of the reasons that we have so many problems in Christian circles today, is there's too many people that walk around with the name of Christian that do not know God on a personal level. Amen. If there's one thing I want to focus on tonight, is I want to know God. And I want to help you all get to know God. John chapter 17 and verse 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your many blessings. We thank You, Lord, for Your mercy. And we thank You, Lord, for Your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we know that there's no power within ourselves to do anything this evening, but only by You, by Your power, and by Your Holy Spirit, Lord, can anything be accomplished. We pray, Lord, that You would anoint us afresh, that You would help us 
that you would anoint our mind and our lips, Father, that we might be able to speak the things that you've laid upon our heart. Father, we rebuke anything that would not be of you. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us. In Jesus' name, amen. There's many different definitions and uses of the word no. The word no can be used in so many different ways, and the definition of that word depends totally upon the context of the sentence that it's being used in. By that, mean, by that I mean to know you can have learned and be able to recall something, and you know it. Most of you all know the multiplication tables. You know some scriptures that you can recall. To know something is to be aware of it. I think she knows. You know, you've heard people say that. To be acquainted with or friendly. To be able to recognize or identify. You know, you're riding down the road or you go in the mall or wherever you go on a daily basis and you, you happen to see a face that's familiar. I know that person. But do you truly know them or do you just recognize their face? Do you have that close, intimate relationship with that person? Or do you just know them? Sometimes we know them as much as being on a first-name basis. We can have relationships that are first-name basis. And I hope by the time I leave here that I'm on a first-name basis with everyone here. But that doesn't mean that I know you. That doesn't mean that I've welcomed you in, or you've welcomed me into your family. That just means we have an acquaintanceship. Amen. And a lot of people today, that's all they have with God. It's just this superficial relationship on the surface. Oh yeah, I recognize God. I recognize His Word. I know who He is. Do you really? Do you know who God is? Do you have that close, intimate relationship that you have with your husband or your wife or with your children, with God? He is your Creator. He is the one that gave you breath and life. He's the one that allowed you to get up this morning. He's the one that allows you to be here tonight. He's the one that allows you to breathe His air, to drink His water. Amen. Do you know Him? That's the important thing. Amen. That's the most important thing in your life tonight, is do you know God? Not just in a superficial way, but to truly know Him. You know, you've got all different kinds of ways of using the word no. Uh, you never know. For all I know. Mother knows best. He's got the know-how. I knew of a man once. Hey, he knows who's who. He knows what's what. She knows a thing or two. He never knew what hit him. It's not all for you to know. Know it all. <laughs> know it all. So when we look at the word know, we need to, in the context of this scripture, figure out what is meant by this word. Jesus, these are the words of Jesus in my Bible, they're written in red, and it says, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. As I looked up a definition, I had a hard time finding one that suited me. So I jotted down this thought, to have an intimate familiarity gained by personal experience. To have an intimate, intimate familiarity gained by personal experience. Amen. When each and every one of us come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, that's not the end all and be all. That's the beginning point. That's the starting. That's the foundation. That's the introduction. Amen. But to come to know God and know Jesus Christ is a journey. It's a, a lifelong pursuit that ends in your eternal salvation and glory. Amen. Where are you tonight in coming to know God? Some people say, well, I, I've accepted Jesus Christ. That's all I need to know. No, you need to know God more than that. That's the starting point. You need to go deeper. You need to find something more. Why? You can't even begin to make sense of even your existence until you come to know God. Your existence doesn't even make, 
make sense. Why are you here? Who put you here? You didn't come from an ape, let me tell you. You didn't evolve out of the slime pit. There's too much genetic information in you that could ever be just randomly slapped together. See, it all boils down to where did it come from? Where did it come from? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I'm sure you've, some of you have heard that term. It takes a whole lot of faith to believe that something can come out of nothing. Amen. That's what atheists believe. That something occurred out of nothing. And that's what they're looking to. Turn over with me to Psalms 100. I've got a lot of scriptures tonight, so I hope you've prepared to flip back and forth quite a few times. And bear with me. Psalms 100, chapter 3, I mean, chapter 100, verse 3. Know you that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Amen. You didn't make yourself. There was a Creator that designed you. He puts you together for His purposes, for His will. Amen. And the only way you're ever going to know what that purpose and will is, is get to know Him more and more every day. To dig into His Word. To seek Him. To listen to His promptings and His leadings. Amen. The only way we can rationally account for right and wrong is through God. Through good or bad, love or hate. The natural laws that are all around us that hold us together. None of these things can be rationalized unless there is an Almighty God who created us, who puts you together, who holds you in place. Turn back with me to Romans chapter 1. If we're going to have a knowledge of God, We have to know Him. We have to, I'm sorry, if we are going to have a relationship with God, we have to know Him. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live for faith, live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that we or they are without excuse. God has revealed Himself all around us, as I've already discussed with you. All the things that we see. My wife and I drove up to Lake Erie this morning before we headed on here. We drove most of the way last night. We got into a hotel about 9 o'clock, and we got rested up and got up early this morning. We drove up to Lake Erie. And as I stood there, on the shores looking at that thing. It was just God blessing me. Waves of God's blessings rolling over me because I looked at that thing and said, God has created all this. God has done all this. He's established the boundaries of this very lake and said, no further, right here is all you can go. And I thought to myself, and the verse came to my mind, O oh man, who art thou? Who art thou? Who do you think you are? Can you do something like this? Is there any group of men? Is there any minds that could put together something so vast and so wonderful? The things of God are all around us. They are clearly seen so that we are without excuse. There is no excuse for anyone in here to doubt that there is a God. You can reject the knowledge of God. But there's no reason for you to doubt God exists. Because He's here. 
And He can be clearly seen throughout all of creation. And if He can be clearly seen, and He can be clearly understood, that means that you can have a personal, close, intimate relationship with Him. It's only by rejecting God and rejecting the knowledge of God that you don't have a relationship with Him. He would that all men be saved. He reaches out for every soul. From the beginning of the world, He wants every soul. I don't care if you're yellow, black, white, pink, purple, every soul He wants to reach out to. He wants all to be saved. You know what keeps people from being saved? They reject the knowledge of God. They reject God. They don't want to know God. Why? Because that brings responsibility. When you come in close for communication with your Creator, it brings a sense of responsibility to your heart. He loved me. He loved me enough to create me. Therefore, I should be thankful. Therefore, I should live according to His rules and His laws and His way. People don't want to hear that. The sinner doesn't want to hear that. The sinner wants to go on his own way. He wants to keep on doing things that he always did. And you can't live for God. You can't know God and keep on doing all the things that you used to do. If you accept Jesus Christ, there will begin a cleaning up process in your life where He's got one hand on the inside and one hand on the outside and the wheel is going round and round and He is slowly perfecting you. Like the potter's wheel. You ever watch the potter work on clay? They've got one hand on the inside of the pot and they've got one hand on the outside of the pot. And that pot is spinning around on that wheel and he's just molding it and shaping it. Creating the image that he wants. And that's what God wants to do with each and every one of us tonight. Where are you in that relationship with knowing God? Are you allowing him to put both hands on you? Does he have the one on the inside, working the inside, cleaning up the heart, cleaning up the thoughts? See, the devil wants to get in there and throw monkey wrenches all in your thoughts. That's where the war is. That's where the battle is, right here in your mind. Amen. Amen. That's where my battle is. The devil, he, you know, he gets in there, he throws all kinds of things in there. And I have to figure out what I'm going to throw out and what I'm going to keep. I don't want to keep anything of him. I want to keep everything of God. Amen. Where God is, that's where I want to be. Amen. Amen. Why? Because I want to be what God would have me to be. I want to be the fullness of what I can be in Him. Amen. That should be the goal of every Christian. To be the fullness of the image of Christ. Amen. That your life bears witness to Christ. That you are filled with Christ. You are filled with His Spirit. And your actions and your words and your thoughts and your deeds all pour out of Christ. Too many people are worried about who they are in Christ. What you need to be worried about is who Christ is in you. Amen. Amen. Get you out of the way. And let Christ pour out of your heart into this world and touch people. Amen. That's how we have impact. That's how we save souls. We don't save souls, I'm sorry. But that's how we impact souls. I can't save a single soul. You realize that? You can't save a single soul. This church can't save a single soul. That's the role of Jesus Christ and His only. But we are to pour ourselves out into this world. We are to pour Christ to every soul that we meet. And that's part of knowing God. If you don't know God and you don't know Jesus Christ, how are you going to pass Him on to someone else? How are you going to impact other lives? That's a real problem in Christianity today. I don't know about this church. I don't know any of you. But there's too many people that don't know enough about Jesus Christ to give Him to somebody else. To pass Him on to somebody else. They've got a superficial knowledge, a superficial experience. They fill a pew. And that's all they've got. That's a shame. That's a shame. I don't know where you stand tonight. But your relationship needs to be deeper than that. It needs to be more than that. Because Jesus Christ didn't call you to fill a pew. He could have called in the animals out here tonight and filled these pews full of animals. But He needs people that love Him. He needs people who are willing to be the vessel for His Spirit and let it pour out. 
people that know God. If you'll read on a little bit further there in Romans chapter 1, you know what? I just noticed something about this church. Most churches have a clock right there over top that door meant just for the preacher. Y'all have a little bitty one over there that I can barely see, so I'm not even going to look at it. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's back here. Oh, that's so y'all. What time did I start? I didn't look, so. And I asked, I asked Brother Gerald tonight um, if there were time constraints. And he said, well, uh, you just preach what the Lord laid on your heart. He didn't put any time constraints on me. So if anybody's upset or you get tired or anything like that, uh, I understand completely. And don't feel bad if you have to go. But I'm going to preach what God laid on my heart. And I'm going to read the verses that God laid on my heart. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 27. On that same topic of knowing God. Because that when they knew God. See, every one of us has some knowledge of who God is. There is not a soul in existence today that, is, that has an excuse. Well, I didn't know God. I never had anyone tell me about God. This verse says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Does that sound like our modern culture or what? Is that our modern society that we live in today, professing themselves to be wise? They know more and more about this world. They know more and more about creation. They have more and more understanding. And the more they know, the further they get away from acknowledging God. Why? They don't want to acknowledge God. They don't want that responsibility. They don't want a superior being having control in their life and guiding and directing them. And what they don't realize is He's controlling it all anyway. His divine hand of providence is in everything that we do, everything we say, everywhere we go, even in their rejection. See, God is looking for people that love Him out of their own choice, out of their own heart, that turn to Him out of their own free will, say, God, I love you. I want to serve you. I'm thankful for what your son did. That's what God wants. See, if God just wanted people to worship Him, He could bring this whole creation to His knees in front of Him and make it worship Him. He could snap His fingers and it would happen in the blink of an eye. Every knee would bow. Every creature would worship Him. That's not what he's looking for. He wants people to come to him like little children. I was so thankful to see that lady bring those little boys tonight. Amen. Those little boys need to know about God. They need to be taught about God. Because Jesus said, except you come as little children. <laughs> Do we have that childlike faith? Are we willing to come to know God? Are we willing to be that open? See, kids are really open. You talk to a four or five year old, they'll tell you anything you want to know about their parents. And their parents will be over there with their face turning red and, you know, they'll be hiding like this. Woo! Just, shh, shh, shh. don't listen to him. See, those little kids are open. Those little kids just want to love. Those little kids just want to be loved. That's what God wants from each and every one of us. But you know what? For the most part, we're too proud, we're too arrogant, we're too stubborn, we're too hard-headed to open ourselves up and say, God, here I am. This is me, God. I know who you are. I know you can save me. I know you can change me. Praise the Lord. He can work on you. But first, you've got to come with that little childlike faith and open up. Say, Lord, I need help. Lord, I'm in trouble. My life is a mess. My soul is a mess. See, that's what He wants to save. He wants to save your soul. Amen. 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 None of us are without excuse. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. 
And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up. God gave them up. See, He's a patient God, but He won't keep on messing around forever. God will give you up. If you want to go your own way, He's not going to grab you by the neck and jerk you back. See, that destroys your free will. That destroys your childlike faith coming to Him. You're just being drugged by your neck. There's no love there. There's no affection. There's no familiarity. There's no getting to know Him when He's got to grab you by your neck and jerk you back. He'll give you up. Amen. When I left church, He let me go. He let me go. He said, go ahead. He didn't jerk me back. But he was faithful to come back and start putting some conviction on my heart. (laughs) Aren't you thankful that God didn't give up on you? So you can all look at me like holy people, that's good. But I know one day you was a sinner, just like I was. I know you were just as filthy and corrupt as I ever was. Amen. And if you think you were something, you are highly confused. And you are deceived of the devil. God didn't save you because He needed you. He saved you because He wanted to. Amen. That's why He saved me. Because He wanted to. He didn't need me. He could have put anybody here tonight and done the same thing. I'm nothing but a a few molecules of dirt with some wind being puffed in and out of it. And He could have put a donkey up here and done the same thing. Amen. But He wanted me. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that tonight. He gave them up to uncleanness. If you'll skip over to verse 28. And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Why did He give them over? Because they did not like to retain the knowledge of God. When they knew who He was, when they understood, hey, there's somebody in control of all this, they rejected that. No, it can't be. That's the world that we live in today. People are looking for an excuse for all this existence. they got people over in Europe smashing little atoms together in some kind of big centrifuge that took them ten years to build and I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars so they could collide particles together in search of what they call a God particle. That's how far our society has gone away from the knowledge of God. That's how far they've gone in the rejection of God. How long do you think God's going to put up with that? Amen. They've gone a long ways in rejecting God. And even if they did find some particle and they named it the God particle, well, where did that particle come from? And I didn't have to spend millions of dollars to find that information. It was very simple. It's a ridiculous world that we live in. Those little boys back there are going to see some stuff. If Jesus doesn't come, those little boys back there are going to see some stuff that none of you could even imagine. It's a scary place because people have rejected God for so long. We need some warriors. We need some spiritual warriors and I'm praying that my little girl here and those little boys back there and those generations will be brought up to know God and to be a warrior for God. A spiritual warrior. I'm not talking about being a Peter and walking around chopping people's ears off. But I'm talking about people who will stand on the Word of God. Who will say, "This thus saith the Lord. This is what I believe because my Creator has written it. Amen. We need people that know God. Not people that just come fill a pew. But truly know God in intimate, close, personal relationship. Gained through familiarity and personal experience. We need personal experience with God. How do we get personal experience with God? Spending time with God. 
Amen. Getting alone. Shutting off the TV. Shutting off the radio. Getting off the phone. And get alone with God. And tarry with God. Say, God, I'm not going to leave here until I hear from you. Amen. We got people who just want to get up in the morning and take off to work. Do this. Do that. They got no time for God. And they don't know God because of it. Amen. If we're going to come to know God, we got to spend time. We got to get alone with Him. So, Lord, I need to hear from you today. I need some direction today in my life. I can't do it on my own. I've been trying to do it on my own. I can't. I need to hear from you. Amen. We need to know God in that kind of way where He speaks to us. And even when we can't discern, we know that He is leading and guiding us. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you, when we get some people dedicated like that, we'll impact the world. We'll start impacting this little community. We'll start impacting my little community back home. My circle of friends, your circle of friends. When you know God, and you know God's direction in your life, and you've got that first personal relationship with Him, you'll be able to share it with others. You'll be able to help others through your familiar experience with Him. Amen. Moving on. John chapter 15. If we've got that pers- close, personal, close relationship, I've got to drink some water. You know, give me a second. If we have that pers- personal close relationship and that understanding of who God is, there will be individual fruitfulness. There will be congregational fruitfulness. And there will be kingdom fruitfulness. People think the church is shriveling up and drying today. Why? It's because we don't know God like we ought to. When we know Him, as this scripture will tell us here in just a minute, when we abide in Him, He will abide in us. And we will bear much fruit. Let's read it. John chapter 15, I am the true vine, my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. Except we abide in Christ. How are we going to abide in Christ if we don't even know who He is? (laughs) If all we have is a superficial knowledge, superficial understanding of the Gospel, you repent, confess, get baptized, you're saved. That's about as far as some people know. What about being filled with God's Spirit? What about being tarrying before God? Pouring out your heart? What about that soul conviction? What about abiding with Him? Staying in connection with Him. Right in the vine. Right in the source of all your spiritual power. That's why people got no power. They're not tapped into the source. Don't tell me you've been saved for 50 years. That doesn't matter. Did you hear what he said? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. There is no such thing as eternal salvation. You're going to work on it, or I shouldn't say that, not eternal salvation. There is no such thing as uh, these people teach every day. Eternal security, thank you. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. What does that teach you? That vine was attached at one time. That was part of the body of Christ at one time. It was tapped into the power source. It was tapped right into the Spirit of God. But what happened? 
didn't bear any fruit. It didn't stay in connection. It didn't do the things necessary to get closer and to know God. It got away from God. It quit bearing fruit. It quit bearing the fruits of the Spirit. It started bearing other kinds of fruit. See, too many people are walking around with the name of Christian that don't bear Christian fruit. That tells me they got some kind of other root that they're attached to. They're not attached to the Christian, to Christ. But they're attached to something. Because there's all kinds of things coming out of their mouth. Words and smoke and everything else. All kinds of stuff going in their mouth. All kinds of hatred being spewed out of their mouth. Amen. Those things are not of Christ. Those things are not fruit of being attached to Him and knowing Him. Those things are from something else. And I think we all know where that attachment is. Amen? Amen. I'm trying to hurry, but we're getting nowhere. <laughs> I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Not a single one of us can do anything for the kingdom of God, except we be attached to Christ. Knowing God is essential to gaining understanding. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 9. I'm going to try to pick up my pace here so we can get out of here hopefully by 10 o'clock. <laughs> to know God, why is, it, why is it essential to know God? It's essential to gaining understanding. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The whole basis for everything that we know and understand is in God. Without God, 4 plus 4 doesn't equal 8. Amen. He is the beginning of everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9. And ten. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. God is essential to us gaining any kind of understanding. To having any kind of growth in your spiritual understanding. And getting into the deeper things of God. You're going to have to get into a deeper relationship with God. John chapter 16. And if you don't want to turn to these, it's fine. Just write them down and look at them later. John chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. It's essential that we know God. It's essential that we be filled with His Spirit if we're going to have understanding. If we're going to have spiritual maturity in the church, if we're going to have people who can lead other people to Christ and then not only lead them to Christ, but then disciple them. See, that's why we have so many dead Christians today. We bring them to a knowledge of Christ. They get saved. They come in, they sit down, and they don't have somebody who has enough knowledge to disciple them, to help them along the way, to help them with their understanding of God's Word and the understanding of the workings of God. We need people who can come alongside new Christians, wrap their arm around them, establish a relationship, 
Say, brother, I want to help you to come to know Christ even deeper than you know Him. You know Him as your Savior. I want to help you come to know Him as your friend. As the one you can trust in. As the one you can rely on. See, we want to just get them saved, set them in the church, okay, clean up, get on with it. Move along. Start growing. Those people need some help. They need discipleship. They need friendship. Forget about discipleship. They need friendship sometimes. They need someone to pick up the phone. Call them. Hey, brother, how you doing? Are you doing all right? You want to go out to lunch today? Can I help you? Is there something I can do? Can I pray with you? We need people with more understanding to be able to do that. You're not going to do that as a new Christian. You're not going to do that unless you have a deep understanding of who God is. God wants to come alongside you. And He wants to come alongside of others through you. Amen. This understanding thing is a real lack in the church today. And on that thought of in the church today, knowing God is essential to unity within the church also. Amen. If everybody in here has a deep understanding of who God is, and you're all you know, studying, you're all seeking God's Spirit, you're seeking God's will, let me tell you, there will be unity in this place. There will be unity of purpose in this place. And if you don't have unity of purpose, I have no idea. I, haven't, I just got here. So I don't know what I'm saying about your unity. But I know God laid it on my heart that if there's going to be unity in this place, it's going to be because you all seek Him and know Him. And that's the only way you're ever going to have any unity in these pews and in this fellowship and outside the doors of this place is by seeking God and knowing Him. A few scriptures on that very thought. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. You're no longer strangers. You know what? There are churches today that they don't have enough knowledge of God in themselves. There's people within the congregation that don't even know one another. Couldn't even tell you a person's name. That's a shame. That's a shame. When there's not enough longing for fellowship and there's not enough longing for unity and the Spirit of God within their own lives that they reach out and start to know others, to love others. Amen. They just come, go. They have nothing. They have no spiritual prompting. have no spiritual love. Amen. Unity is built on that, knowing God. That's how you develop unity within this fellowship. That's how y'all are going to come together and impact your world is through that unity of knowing God. I serve the same God you do. My daughter said, we'll, we won't know anybody there tonight. I said, we'll know everybody there tonight. If they know Jesus Christ, I know every one of them. Amen. I might not know your face, I might not know your name, but I know the Spirit. And I can feel the Spirit. And I felt the Spirit standing right out there from a warm, friendly relationship. Warm, friendly love and welcome. Another brother in Christ. I didn't know a thing about you. But I knew that. I could tell. It's a wonderful thing. When it's working the way it's supposed to be working. Praise the Lord. Now we got to get the rest of them. I understand there's maybe not everybody here tonight. we got to get them all in here. And start working on that unity thing. Start loving one another. I thought that was wonderful. That everyone getting up and shaking hands and welcoming one another and welcoming me and my family. See, that builds unity. That builds community and fellowship and love. God bless you for doing that. Each and every one of you. God bless you. We need that. There's too many cold, dead churches that people just got 
grudges on this side and grudges on this side. And they're walking around with chips on their shoulders. Some of them got calluses up here on their shoulders. They've been carrying chips so long. The chips didn't turn from a chip into a log. I know a little bit about logs because I, I own a tree company, so I've carried many a log on my shoulder. Them things get heavy. It ain't too long you need somebody to come along and help you with that load. And then when you get somewhere where you can throw that load off, what a relief. Amen. People need to throw off the grudges. I don't know what it was you was upset about, and it probably don't matter by now. Need to get over it. Start loving one another. Because Jesus first loved you. <laughs> he loved us, sister. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Even when I was a sinner and despicable and disgusting person, He loved me. And He loved you. Amen. Love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not because you're a Baptist. Not because you're a Methodist. Not because you're Church of God. Not because you're brethren. But because you love one another. Amen. I don't care what title he puts in front of his name. I can love that person if he's got the Spirit of Christ living in him. But if he's got a staunchness built out of these denominations and all these other things, and, oh, you're a church of God. I can't love Him. He won't let me love Him. He won't let me have relationship. He won't let me have community because I don't fit into His little program. Let me tell you, there shouldn't be a single soul in here like that. If you find somebody that you can love, I don't care if he's a Jehovah Witness. If you can love Him, maybe you can win Him to Christ. Amen. If he's a Catholic, maybe if he'll let you love him, you can win him to Jesus Christ. He won't no longer trust in all his catechisms. He'll no longer trust in the priest. He'll no longer trust in the Pope. But he'll trust in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he'll know what it means to live by faith. Amen. But he'll never learn any of that if we turn our backs on him. Oh, he's a Catholic. I'm church of God, I can't talk to him. He got too many problems, too many issues. Let me tell you, there's some people that says church of God on their name. They got problems and issues too. They're everywhere. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, while we're here, well I didn't even finish reading all of it. I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 uh, now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Do you know, you folks right here in this room are built together for a habitation of God? Do you know the Spirit of God wants to dwell in this place? This is nothing but a building. This is, I mean, this, I was shocked when I come here. I had no idea what to expect when I got here. And I was like, man, this is a nice building. From the outside, it looked kind of small, but I got in, I was like, whoa, this is way more building. God don't care about this building. This building could burn down tonight and this church will keep going straight on because the church is you. And when you all come together in unity and harmony, serving the same God, loving the same God, you'll be a dwelling space for the Spirit of God. You'll be a dwelling place for the Creator God. I'm not talking about your Santa Claus. I'm not talking about the one you cry to about all your problems. I'm talking about the creator of this universe. You will be a dwelling place for Him. You will be His habitation. That is an awesome thought that gives me bumps down to my toes. That when we come together, we are a habitation for Almighty God. See, people's picture of who God is is way too small. Their idea of who God is is way too small. 
God's way bigger than anything you can imagine. And we try to put Him in a little box. He fits here. He does things this way. No, God does what He wants to do. Amen. Amen. We need to get rid of the boxes. Forget about our categories. Start loving one another and be a habitation for Him. And then the glory of God will fill this congregation and fill this place. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. In fact, for the sake of time, let's go over to 2 Corinthians. I'll skip that one. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses fourteen, starting in fourteen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Viala? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. We just talked about us coming together and being a habitation of God. There are going to be sinners that we come in contact with. They may even be sinners in this church. But that doesn't affect the temple of God. Can you believe that? What he's talking about there is in your own personal life and in your own heart the things that would be contrary to the Spirit of God. Don't be looking around at other people and trying to shut other people out and push other people off to the corner because they don't fit your mold. You get yourself straight. You get your own life straight. You weed out the sin in your own life. Amen. Because Christ will not dwell in an unclean temple. And you are the temple of God, each and every one of you. Amen. You're the temple of God. And He won't dwell in a place that's unclean. If there's any searching to be done, if there's any witch hunt that needs to happen, if there's any looking that needs to happen, it's in your own heart. It's right here. This is where the biggest trouble I have is. Right here. Not other people. I'd like to see this place full of sinners. Praise God. I'd love to see it full of sinners so that we can help them. Amen. So that Jesus Christ can save their soul. And then we can have fellowship and unity. But if I get to looking around, talking about their sin, or talking about their problems, trying to walk all over on their toes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run those people right out that door. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's not the job of the preacher. There's too many preachers today that stand in the pulpit and want to pick at people's lives. That's not your job. That's not the preacher's job, and that's not the lady's job. None of you have the right to pick apart people's lives. Let the Spirit work. Let them check their own hearts out. And you get busy checking yours out. You see where God would have you clean up a little bit more. Just like I said about that illustration, one hand on the inside and one hand on the outside. See, too many people want to put both hands on the outside and get everything looking just right. Oh man, that's a good looking Christian right there, ain't it? And the inside of that thing is so full of nastiness and despicable, disgusting stuff. Need to get the heart straightened up. Need to get the inside worked out. And only God can do that because I can't see inside your hearts tonight. You might agree with everything I say. I have no idea what's on the inside. Only God knows. And you will answer to Him one day for that. It is essential to know God that we might worship Him. I think of the illustration, in fact, I've got it written down here, the Samaritan woman at the well. She said, Lord, should we worship in Jerusalem or in this mountain? 
Jesus said, you worship, you know not what. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people that come to church nowadays and they worship, they know not what. They worship their own puffed up ideas. They worship their own doctrines. They worship their own idols. They got their little doctrinal idols they set up. Oh, it's got to be this way. And they worship them things. You worship, you know not what. Jesus said, the Father looketh for them that worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I can't apply truth to your life. I can't apply truth to anybody's life but my own life. And when I know God, and I'm worshiping Him in truth and in spirit, oh, what a glorious thing. When I'm being faithful to Him. That's what He's looking for for each and every one of us. He wants people that will worship Him. Not stand up and say, Hallelujah! But when they get up in the morning, and they go down the bank, or they go down to the McDonald's, and the cashier gives them an extra dollar, and they walk away and say, Man, that was nice. Is that worshiping God in spirit and truth? Or maybe they're walking along and they see, you know, in Walmart, there's a nice cell phone laying there. Man. That's a nice cell phone. Somebody, somebody must have lost that. That's not worshiping God in spirit and truth. That went from a lost cell phone to a stolen cell phone. And that's just a simple illustration. But you can put that out there into all parts of your life, in all avenues of your life. Worshiping God is more than coming to this place. Worshiping God is much greater than coming here and singing a few songs and saying hallelujah and raising your hand. Worshiping God is a daily activity through our lives, through our activities, through our words, through our love, through our kindness. That's all worshiping God. That's what it truly means to worship God. There's no room for bitterness If you're claiming to worship the God that I know, there's no room for hatred or anger if you're worshiping the God I know. There's no room for prejudices, grudges, none of these things if you're worshiping the same God that I know. Amen. In any direction. That's what it means to worship God. We come here to get together in fellowship, to encourage one another, To love one another. The true worship happens day after day after day in your life. Amen. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Why is this so important? Well, there's a couple of more scriptures that I want to touch on. Turn over to Jeremiah. Chapter 9, verse 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. He has no delight for people that come in and put on a show of worship when their life has no worship. When their life has nothing real. When their life lacks righteousness and loving kindness and judgment. Does your life exude that tender loving kindness? That's part of worshiping God. You don't worship God in how strong you are or how smart you are. But you worship God in your loving kindness, your mercy, your good judgment. 
All those things are worshiping God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That you can be the quietest little church mouse in here. Now I know some of you folks in here are very quiet. Probably never said a word in church in your whole life. But you know what? Your life can praise God in a mighty, mighty way that would bring more glory and honor to Him than anything that could ever be said or spoken or sung. Isn't it a wonderful thing that there's different ways to worship God? We don't have to be this big vocal hallelujah running up and down the aisles. We don't have to be the most magnificent singer in the world. You can sit here and never say a word and your life just worshiping God. Your life just glorifying God. Bringing Him honor and praise. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Amen. Because my poor wife, she don't hardly say five words. I don't think I've ever heard her speak out in church. But you know what? Her life worships God. Her life brings glory to God through her actions. I'm a very, very lucky man. Very lucky man. To have a wife that loves God and worships God through her actions and through her deeds. Amen. If you don't have one like that, I pray God will send you one like that. Or work on the one you got and make him like that. Or make her like that. Amen. We all know people like that. Amen. Every one of us know people who their whole life glorifies God, but yet they're just as quiet as can be. Those are special, special people. They have a special place in my heart, and I think in God's heart too. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What? In verse 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Glorify God in your body. You know, these people who walk around and have no regard for they're doing in their body they're pouring in stuff that shouldn't be there they're inhaling stuff that shouldn't be there and yet oh they get up and praise God they're not glorifying God they're not worshiping God he said worship God in your body and that even goes down the line to what we feed ourselves amen when we go down to the buffet and we just sit there and keep on, keep on trying to get our money's worth. We're not glorifying God in our bodies. I struggle with that. I'll be honest with you. And I have to remind myself, are you glorifying God? Are you worshiping God by this? On my way up here, we stopped at a buffet. And when I walked in the door, there was a gentleman sitting over there, and God bless him. I hope the Lord helps the man. But he's almost ready for medical care. He, he's gotten so large. And some people can't help it. But let me tell you something. If you're in that condition, you don't need to be down at the buffet. I felt so sorry for the man. And at the same time, I was so thankful that God placed him there when I walked in the door that I would be reminded, don't go in here and stuff your face full, son. You're not glorifying me. Now we're touching, you know, on some touchy issues here, but it's truth anyway. Whether you want to hear it or not, it's truth. We are to worship God in our bodies and our spirits. Amen. I don't mean to offend anyone, and I hope I didn't offend anyone. But we need to be aware of these things. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to love you. I'm concerned about your soul. That's why I spoke about those things. I'm here to glorify God. 
and be a witness for Him. And I don't think those things glorify God. Amen. But I want you to know it's done in a heart of love and compassion. Knowing God is essential to our eternal destination. The Scripture that we started out with this evening. John 17 and 3. This is life eternal. That they might know Thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. You know, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter in. Matthew chapter 7, 21, 23 teaches us. Jesus in His very own words. So not everyone that calleth on my name, not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and have we not done that? Have we not went and been missionaries? Have we not uh, done all these miracles in your name? Have we not cast out demons? What did Jesus say? Depart from me. Depart from me. Can you imagine standing before your Savior? Standing before the one you thought you were doing all these things in His name. And hear Him say, depart from me. What an awesome, awful thing that must be. For a soul to hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He never knew you. See, it's that knowledge thing again. It's that close, intimate, personal relationship gained through personal experience. It wasn't there. I never knew you. Let us each one examine ourselves tonight. It's an awful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's real. He's living. His Spirit is in this place. His Spirit is in you if you know Him tonight. And He's talking to hearts in here tonight. I'm concluding my message. But if there's one thing I want you to carry away from here tonight, is a renewed desire to know God to reestablish that close, intimate relationship. I want you to spend some time tarrying with God. Shut off all the distractions in your life. I don't know where they are. People in Michigan don't live the same as people in Virginia. I don't know what your distractions are. I have a feeling they're very similar. But shut them off. It's not worth losing your soul over. Amen. It's not worth getting to the end and hearing, depart from me. I never knew you. Do you want to know God tonight? If you're here tonight and you don't know Him the way you want to, this altar is open. If you need someone to pray with you, I'd be happy to pray with you. If you just want to pour your heart out before God and have nobody disturb you, that may even be the best way for you to reestablish that connection. For you to come to know God again. Have that close, intimate relationship that you once had. Have that zeal and that fire that you once had. To have it renewed. The opportunity is here this evening. It's here for each and every one of us. I'll leave the thoughts with you. I think Sister Michael has a song prepared. But truly what we don't need is, I mean, what we need is honest hearts. We don't need music. Music is wonderful. It creates an atmosphere of worship. But what we need are hearts and souls that are ready to worship God. Then it won't matter whether there's music playing or it's deathly quiet when hearts are ready to seek Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for Your faithfulness. We thank You, Lord, that You've laid upon our hearts, Lord, the thoughts that You would have. 
We pray, Lord, that we would be able to renew our relationship with you, O oh God. Father, if there are souls here tonight who have maybe drifted away or maybe, Lord, just gotten a little distant and a little cold, we pray, Lord, that you would move upon them, that you would extend your loving kindness and mercy to them. Father, that you would renew that relationship deep down in their souls, that they might know you, O oh God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Father, we know our eternal destination relies on knowing you. Oh God, we just pray that every soul here would have that desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and turn to page 175. Page 175. God has sent the Holy Spirit to our hearts an honored guest to deliver us from evil and to bring us peace and rest. He has come to work within us. Heaven's purpose is so blessed. He He wants his way in thee. That's what he wants in each and every one of us. He wants a life and a heart that's surrendered. He wants to bless this place. He wants to bless you as a people. He wants to bless you as an individual. And the only way that he can do that is if he has his way in you and in your heart. Are there any little areas where you've kind of pushed God to the side and said, God, this is my area, this is my time, my priorities here. We can't have any of those in the way of God. He wants to have complete control. He wants to have complete reign in your life. He wants to have His way in thee. Amen. As we continue on with this, mo this meeting, He wants to have His way in you and me. He wants to have his way in this meeting. If this meeting will be a success, it will be because he had his way. And no one got in the way of his way. As we sing another verse, does he have his way in thee? He doth sometimes work in silence when thou dost not know at all he doth sometimes speak so softly thou must listen for his call but if thou wilt trust him fully he will be thine all in all he wants his word
We thank God for the message tonight, Amen. for his presence here, and for his faithfulness. Pray diligently for the service tomorrow night and for Amen. Brother David as God would move upon him with another message. And for those who have been invited, that their hearts would be troubled and they would have a desire to come. Sister Blau, would you dismiss us in prayer? <laughs>